Take your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and we'll be looking especially at verse 27 and beyond. If you need a Bible, that's page 889 in the Pew Bible, Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 27. skipped my uh, membership class this morning, not feeling like I wanted to stay in for an extra 45 minutes, so they got to hear Pastor Matt, which was a good thing for the members to be exposed to one of our missionaries. Now, for those of you who don't know, Pastor Matt was pastor here before the Lord called him and Jim and their family back into missions. He had the privilege of serving the Lord and partnering with Christians around the globe. And we get to be part of that. One of the things that we do as a church is we financially support and we pray for and way in, in ways that we can, we help missionaries. And Pastor Matt is one of our missionaries. We have a few different offerings. We basically just take an offering once, although people have, have gotten towards doing it online, that's, that's, that's a strange thing to me. I, I, I still write off paper checks. I was in the bank a while back and said, oh, you still write checks, don't you? Yeah, I do. But, <laughs> but um, uh, we have our, our regular general fund offering. That's how we pay for stuff, basically. Uh, the heat and lights and insurance and pastor's salary and things like that, and then we also take a portion of that and give it to a variety of, of missionaries. We, we support them. If you go down the hallway, you'll see our kind of hall of faith with pictures of our missionaries, and a portion of what is given in the general fund goes for supporting those missionaries, but we, we also have another missionary offering that we call Faith Promise, and because it's kind of on top of everything else we're doing, we're Trusting the Lord by faith to supply each of us with extra money so that we can give extra. And we support homegrown missionaries. And guess what? Matt is a homegrown missionary. He was part of this church family before he became a missionary in Spain for a, a while. Had come home for family health reasons and uh, then was, was pastor here. Um, he was part of a young adult group. Uh, Chad Huber was part of that, another of our Faith Promise missionaries. And Melissa Russell, who was Melissa Jones back then, was part of, of, of that group. So these homegrown missionaries we support through the Faith Promise program. And so uh, each week when I write out a check from my salary, I write out a portion to the general fund giving, and then I write out a portion to go to faith promise giving. And I don't take away from my general fund giving in order to give the faith promise. I trust the Lord to meet our needs, and we help to partner with Matt and Jen and Chad and Esther and Naomi and David and Anna. That's our job, folks. That's what we do, which is what we're talking about here in the Gospel of John. Verse 27 of John chapter 4, just then the disciples came back. Just then, at that moment, at that very moment, something happened. And we have seen in John's Gospel that Jesus is on a schedule. A schedule that will eventually lead to the cross and finally to his glorification and the accomplishment of God's purpose. We saw he had to pass through Samaria. He, well, he had a scheduled appointment with a woman with a messed up life. A woman who was thirsting for satisfaction. Satisfaction that has eluded every man and woman since the Garden of Eden. She had a religion. She had human relationships. She had husbands. A number of them. But none of these gave her satisfaction. She tried all of these things to fill a God-shaped vacuum in her life, and none of them worked. 
How could they? None of those things are God-shaped. And then she met Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Only Jesus is God-shaped. After all, he is God. Now, she did not schedule the appointment. Jesus did. That's why he came. He has engaged her attention. He's made her face her real problem, which is the sin that separated her from God and caused the thirst in her life. And in that moment of crisis, faced with something she didn't want to talk about, she remembers a truth she's been taught. I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. The Samaritans had a lot of things messed up. What, can, what else do you expect when you take truth from God and you mix it with the ideas of people? They, the Samaritans rejected all of the Old Testament except for the five books of Moses. They rejected everything that told about how God had chosen the house of David to be the channel through which God would send the deliverer. But she had heard of the deliverer. God promises to send the deliverer in Genesis 3.15 in the first book of Moses. In his last book, Deuteronomy, Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So she says, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus told her, Here I am. I who speak to you. Yeah. And she believed him. She trusted in him. He, he had told her, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And she believed him. She was like Nathaniel, who we saw become a disciple back in chapter 1. He didn't think much of Nazareth, just like she didn't think much of Jews. But when he found that Jesus knew him like only God could know him, he knew that Jesus was the one he was looking for. He believed in him and followed him. And this woman responds like Nathaniel. She believes him. She trusts in him. Now question. Does she trust Christ's work on the cross at this point? Not yet, but she will. She knows this at least, that all of those animal sacrifices on Mount Gerizim did not make her right with God. It will take another sacrifice to make that happen. And she will come to understand that, just like Nathaniel and Nicodemus. Nathaniel, with his own eyes, will see the risen Christ. After the cross, Nicodemus will step out from the shadows and take his stand for the crucified Savior. And this woman of Samaria will understand the cross one day soon, when the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing. But for those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Nathaniel, the disciple, followed Jesus. This woman will not. When Jesus leaves two days later, she will not go with him. Now, we mentioned that Paul never uses the expression, follow Jesus. I read John Piper write that some time ago, and he's right. Paul never uses that expression. You only find it in the Gospels. Paul uses other expressions to describe the life of faith. Now, why is it used in the Gospels? Well, in the Gospels, the closest disciples to Jesus physically went where Jesus went, learning from him. So as we read through the Gospels, their following him becomes a vivid picture of having a relationship with him. But that's not what this woman did. What did she do? Because, you know, when a person becomes a believer in Christ, there are things they do because they're a believer. 
as John Calvin said, faith alone saves, but faith that saves is never alone. Well, what will she do? She will serve her Lord right where she is. We saw last week, she leaves her water jar and says, I'll be right back. And she won't come alone. And just then, the disciples come back. It happens just then. Because she understands something that they do not. And they need to learn. Jesus is on a schedule. So are his disciples. And so are you. What do we read when we were studying Romans 8? Verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things are working together because God is working them together and he's doing it for our good. Good things, bad things, trials, troubles, illnesses, accidents, genetic accidents like our grandmother, disappointments, even failure. God can make all and does make all work ultimately for our good. God has a purpose and he's working it out in us, in his people, in the ones he's called himself in order to fulfill his purpose. It's a good one. It's a good purpose. After all, it's God's purpose. It's got to be good. In all things from the farthest star to the tiniest sparrow are his tools to bring it about. All of God's people are on a schedule. At that moment, the disciples show up. This is the providence of God. If they had come a moment earlier, they would have interrupted that vitally important conversation between Jesus and the woman. If they had come a moment later, they would not have seen him talking with a woman. And that's vitally important, too. Verse 27. What happened when they got back from McDonald's just at that moment? They marveled. And the, in the tense of the verbs, they kept on marveling. They marveled and kept on marveling that he was talking with a woman. Now, Jesus was a rabbi. At least that's what they call it. A Jewish religious teacher. Rabbis had rules. Here is one quote. Let no one talk with a woman in the street. No, not with his own wife. End of quote. That is the rule. Where did the rule come from? Well, people made it up. It fit the traditions of their culture. And as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, traditions have never saved the soul. But Jack was on. But no one said, but you see, Gordon, why are you talking with her? <laughs> Good move, guys. They're beginning to learn that he knows what he's doing. They're beginning to learn to trust him. Now, they haven't really got it yet. Peter especially will come to him more than once and say, uh, that's not a good idea. But they're beginning to learn. What do you seek? A drink. Why are you talking with her? To give her living water. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life, will have living water, unending, inexhaustible. That's why he had to go through Samaria. That's why the disciples were scheduled to arrive at that moment. They are disciples. They follow in order to learn. So let the lesson begin. This woman leaves her water jar, runs into town, tells everybody she met about this man who told her everything she ever did. And it gets a response. John says they went out of the town and were coming to him. They rushed off immediately. That's the tense of the verb. And in the background, from where Jesus and the disciples are standing, you can see the crowd gathered, coming down the half-mile path to the well, and that sets the stage for the lesson. Verse 31, while the woman was running into town, so 
The conversation is over. So they walk up to Jesus with their bag of burgers and fries. John says the disciples were urging him, and they kept on urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Now, just as kind of a side light, they, they called him rabbi, which means a teacher. But it's instructive, I think, if as you read through the Gospel of John, there will be a gradual change. Those who know him stop calling him rabbi and start calling him Lord. They will come to have a clearer view of who he is. He's the Lord. But to the important issue of the moment, eat. Crowds getting closer. Eat while you can. That's why they went into town. Now Jesus was tired, thirsty, and hungry. Remember, he's human. Time to eat. Now, that's important, isn't it? There's a reason why there are crumbs on Fred's shirt. <laughs> and we spend a lot of time doing that, don't we? Well, that is the way God designed us humans. Genesis 2.16, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat. Psalm says, Psalm 104, verse 14, he caused the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for men to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth. We even spent a lot of time doing that in church. Now, I've heard preachers wax eloquent putting down church dinners. Nonsense. That's what the early church did, folks. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Okay? Now, I'm not, I'm not feeling real well, so I'm going to bow out. And, uh, did I mention I'm not giving a to Jason? <laughs> Some things I don't want to share. Uh, but uh, but we're going to have a meal. There, there's something about sitting around the table together that satisfies both body and soul. But here's the lesson. There are things so much more important. What he said to them, verse 32, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Masterful opening to the lesson. They thought about food all the time, just like you and me. Now, they didn't get what he was saying. Verse 33, so the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? They, they did not get it because they were thinking like ordinary people. Now, it's good to think like ordinary people think, right? Because it makes you able to communicate. Think like ordinary people. No, it's not good. Because, as Paul says, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. That's why God's people need to renew their minds. Be transformed, Paul says, by the renewing of your mind. They need to learn to think differently. They need to learn to think spiritually. Nicodemus needs to learn to think spiritually or he will never see the kingdom of God. The Samaritan woman needed to learn to think spiritually or she will thirst for the rest of her life. The disciples need to learn to think spiritually or they will be no use in the work that God has called them to. So here's how they need to change their thinking. Jesus said to them, verse 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Have you ever heard the expression that somebody says, Ah, that's gravy to me. You ever hear that? It's like gravy on the potatoes. That's good. That's where it's at. Now, the disciples were not there for the conversation with the woman. So they're, they're out of the left field as to what's going on here. And they, sure, like nobody brought him food yet. I mean, these are Samaritans. They're not going to feed a Jew. So, time to learn. Time to think differently. My food 
that which imparts satisfaction to me, that which delights my soul, Jesus said, is to do the will of my sender and to accomplish his work. God has a plan, and it will be accomplished. Jesus says, that's my job. That's why I came. And he will get the job done. In three years' time, after, last, after the Last Supper, just before the cross, in the hearing of the disciples, Jesus will pray, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus will say to the Father, I've done it. I've accomplished it. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. The only hope for any person anywhere is to know God. This is life eternal. That they know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Well, John opened his gospel by saying, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Nathaniel and the other disciples has begun to know God. Nicodemus has begun to know God. The Samaritan woman has begun to know God because the only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. And they will not completely know him until they see his love for them demonstrated at the cross. For God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And on the cross, Jesus will say, in fact, he will shout it in a loud voice, it is finished. It is accomplished. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's greed. And guys, it needs to be greedy to you to look up. What do they see? They see a bunch of people coming down the road. Unexpected people. Not really welcome people. People that did not come to their minds when it came to people who were loved by God. They need to look at those people, even these people, and think in terms of a harvest. Verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? You see, the, the disciples had said this. They're walking down the road, that they're seeing these these fields that look like green grass with barley. Four more months, and it'll be harvest time. Not all that long ago, I was driving down the road, driving by a wheat field, and I looked at it all, it, it, it was that bright golden color that tells you it's ready. A couple of days later, I drove down that same road and that field dumped with stubble. They harvested it, ready. Look up, guys. The harvest is right there. See those people? They are a harvest. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. The expression white for harvest means the color has changed. They're not green anymore. It's ripe. The seed has been planted. The plants have grown. Now it's ripe. Time to gather it in. As Jesus said in the parable of the soils, the seed is the word of God. It's the truth about Jesus Christ. As messed up as the Samaritan religion was, at least it left them looking for the Messiah. And nobody among the Jews had any idea how right they were until a woman without a water jar came running into town yelling, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Can this be the Christ? The sickle was swung, the harvest begun. 
Verse 36. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. All through the centuries, God has been at work. His word has been planted and growing. Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Guys, this is your job. Bring in the harvest of the word of God. Well, who sowed the seed? Moses did. John the baptizer. Every faithful Levite down through the century who actually did his job and taught the word of God. Jesus. And a woman, we don't even know her name. They sowed the seed. Now it's harvest time. It's a harvest of faith. These people were coming because of what the woman told them. She gave testimony of what she knew. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him. Because of the woman's testimony, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, he asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. It's a harvest, not just of people who have heard, but of people who believe, people who know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. It's a harvest of people who, like the Samaritan woman, know that they are hopeless sinners and have come to know the Savior who went to the cross to pay for their sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus is telling these men, guys, it's not about what's for lunch. As important as that is, it's about a harvest of souls. That is your job. What a privilege that you get to gather it in. This, this is the climax of the ages. And when you look at that job like I do, it will be great to you. Now let me ask you, is it great to you? Serving the Lord? Sharing his word? Given your simple testimony? Supporting and praying for missionaries? Even maybe sacrificing a bit so you can do that? Is that gravy to you? It ought to be, shouldn't it? That's what Jesus was telling his disciples. That's what John 